The cross country road trip. It's 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas. It's dark and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. It's a quintessentially American tradition that's built upon an historic infrastructure investment. The Federal Aid Highway Act of the 1950s laid the groundwork for the backbone of American transportation today. But zoom in a bit closer and you'll find towns and cities all across the country that were divided and whole neighbourhoods displaced by new highways. Half a century later, many of those freeways are ageing and degraded, and cities are grappling with the question, do we repair the highway or do we tear it down? And what do we put in its place? We've got a grand narrative of the achievements of the interstate highway system. There is not as prominent a reflection of the costs of the interstate highway system. Historians do say that the Tampa Bay area has highways that were designed to displace minorities. We see this sort of pattern where we are looking at decisions that were made mid-century that really did change this community. This became a dividing point for people who oftentimes traverse these neighborhoods back and forth. What we see now with this new infrastructure bill, we can actually make amends, literally mending back neighborhoods to hopefully bring back and revive what were in these areas. In the future, as far as our interstate, it's all important as the railroads were important to the community a hundred years ago. Historians call the interstate highway system the greatest public works project in American history, potentially even in world history. Liddell Winling is working to map the effects of the interstate highway system across America. It was intended and was a massive employment and public works project that put labor contractors, whether it be concrete, like construction contractors, to work in cities, metropolitan areas, states around the country. And so like those um, equivalent of $500 billion of investment went into the pockets of workers. Now, to say the interstate highway system was a massive undertaking is probably underselling it. Over 48,000 miles of highways were constructed across desert sands, farmland, mountains and through cities. The sheer scale and ambition of the project is astounding, and the impact it had on American society is undeniable. Moving from state to state, city to city and to and from rural areas became a whole lot easier. Travel, job opportunities and trade routes all opened up because of the highway system. And America's love affair with the automobile got a whole lot stronger. Today, most American towns and cities are still designed to prioritize cars rather than pedestrians. The way that the public understands the legacy and the impacts of the interstate highway system is changing. As the highway interstate program expanded into major cities, highway revolts began popping up across the country, protesting the construction of new roads through urban areas. In some cases, highway building was used as a tool to reinforce racial segregation and transport people around and out of city centers. According to the US Department of Transportation, more than a million people were displaced from their homes in the first 30 years of highway construction. Half a century later, the effects of these projects, like environmental and noise pollution, are unequally felt by the people who live near them. One of those communities split by a highway was Rochester, New York. Now, they're taking that highway down. And in Rochester in particular, we had what we call an inner loop, which was literally a loop around the city, which cut off many neighborhoods, in particular the neighborhood where I grew up in. And so you had this great divide, so we lost our resources, lost our connections to what we did have in the neighborhood, and so that creates a decline. Rochester's 2.68 mile inner loop was proposed in 1947 and constructed between 1952 and 1965. It wraps around Rochester's downtown area and distributes traffic around the core. Some residents have come to know it as a moat that's divided the city. Still, it's become part of the fabric of daily life here in Rochester. To talk about a removal, it's people like, whoa, 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 slow down, hold your horses. What are we gonna do? What happens to traffic? Ideas for the removal of the inner loop have been proposed since 1991. 
taking down part of the highway would give the city an opportunity to prioritise walkability and development for all the neighbourhoods around the downtown area. By the 2010s, the highway was in bad shape. Its bridge crossings needed continuous investment to keep them functional, and the east section of the inner loop was operating below capacity, carrying just about 2,000 vehicles a day per lane. So instead of fixing it, the city decided to take part of it down. We replaced this highway with uh, generally a two to three lane roadway with on-street parking, wide sidewalks, and a protected two-way bicycle facility through the entire length. Eric Frisch was in charge of managing the Inner Loop East project for the city of Rochester. Pre-pandemic, we saw a more than doubling of bicycle and pedestrian traffic in this area, and that's prior to most of the housing and, and other development taking place. So we know just by removing this highway, by providing an environment that people would want to be in, people are coming, you can see it, and it's bringing new life and vitality to this part of town. The Inner Loop East transformation project was one of the first major highway removal schemes in the country. Project managers said people's travel time has only gone up by a matter of minutes. It cost about $20 million to pull off, and the project got most of its funding from an Obama-era federal grant program. It took engineering firm Stantec nine months to remove 4,400 feet of four to six lane expressway and three bridges, and clear out six acres of land for development. Now, the empty land's being redeveloped to add new bike lanes, businesses, and large residential blocks. The project's been so successful that the city now wants to do it all again, and remove the remainder of the highway called Inner Loop North. But this time around the project's bigger, more technically ambitious, and more complicated. The city's proposing to take down a longer stretch of highway, creating 20 acres of land for redevelopment, with a budget closer to 90 million. But of course, fixing the damage that's been done by a piece of infrastructure like this is more complicated than just removing a road and building something in its place. There's always the risk that redeveloping an area could price out current residents. Currently, on opposite sides of that inner loop, you know, 500 feet across from one another, you have one group that's predominantly black and brown. Most home sales are for between 65 to 80 thousand dollars, and on that other 500 feet, you have mostly older Caucasians, and uh, home sales over there are 500 to 750 thousand dollars. So you've got to you've got to figure out how you create this this how do you mend this. Um, and bring progress. I was pretty inspired to learn that Sean had formed a community group with the residents in the neighbourhood across the highway to discuss what they wanted to go in the road's place. Their focus is smaller developments that can support single-family homes for local residents, rather than the big megablock developments that are popping up in place of Inner Loop East. We can actually physically try to design and create, once again, connected neighbourhoods and help facilitate home ownership help facilitate community wealth building. Now, Rochester isn't the only city tearing down its highways. Congress for the New Urbanism has tracked at least 40 highway removal proposals across the US. And while highway teardowns have been talked about by local communities for years, the idea is now gaining more traction in Washington. In an earlier draft of the US infrastructure bill, Democrats set aside $15 billion to fund projects like this through the Reconnecting Communities Act. But in the bipartisan bill that ultimately passed, that funding was cut down to just $1 billion. Now, for context, just one highway removal that's being proposed in Syracuse, New York, is expected to cost close to $2 billion. The reconnecting communities, that billion dollars, is something we want to get to work right away, uh, uh, putting to work. It's going to be the catchphrase for the next couple of years, you know, reconnecting communities and rebuilding families. It's going to be there. And so that's why it takes folks uh, across the country to keep putting hammer to nail and saying, hey, you said this, you've got to adhere to this, you've got to adhere to this. And that's, that's important. The next chapter in Rochester shows both the potential success and nuance involved in removing legacy infrastructure. Highway demolitions aren't a silver bullet for a city's problems, but Rochester's inner loop projects can serve as a sort of test case for other cities as they decide what to do with their aging infrastructure. I would just say that the greatest risk would be removal of interstate highway segments without consideration of the most directly affected populations or without planning in the context of a broader set of like urban development considerations, including affordable housing, including recreational space, including considerations of public transit 
mobility and especially accessibility. Of course, each city's situation is unique, but highway teardowns point to a bigger shift in how city planners are now viewing the role of cars. We can serve the car, but it doesn't need to be the driving force, if you will. We can create urban communities that you can drive in, but that are much more focused on people. The interstate highway system forever reshaped America in ways that are still felt today. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The highway teardowns happening now are a powerful reminder of how we can learn from the past to build a better future. If you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.